Hello everyone, welcome to another live hangout here at Voice Essentials. So good to have you joining us for today's show. Uh, if you are watching this as a replay, hello to you also. We do this show um, every Monday, Australian Eastern Standard Time at 1 p.m. and uh, and it's, it's so good to be here. I've got a special guest, uh, someone who I can actually you know, we, we have so many great guests here on the show, but uh, today we're actually having someone who I can legitimately say is also a friend. Um, but uh, that by no means <laughs> means that it's not going to be a fantastic show with Zach Bradford. He is going to be, he is a fantastic singing teacher and researcher. Um, and uh, he's a friend because we've known each other for, dearie me, I, 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 it, I, it pains me to think how long, because <laughs> it just makes me feel old. But anyway, we'll talk about that more in a moment. And uh, I know you're going to really enjoy having uh, Zach on the show with me because he has just got this wealth of knowledge and uh, and uh, so much experience to bring to us today. We're going to be talking about, um, uh, you know, well, the, the thumbnail kind of said it all. Horses for Courses is going to be talking about different techniques and how they apply to different genres and uh, i hope you'll tune in if you are in the live chat hello everyone hello i think i saw scuba girl and linda of course and uh who else kathy snyder's there and there's a whole heap of all the usuals it's so good to have you join us um as you know um generally speaking when we have a guest on the show we don't typically get to answering questions um, so just to put it out there that we may not get to your question um, today, but equally we'll be doing a, a Q and A next week. All things being equal, so you can still ask your questions um, in the chat, in the live chat, and Linda will definitely take down your questions, and uh, and we'll do our best to get to those next week if we have the chance. Now, someone that is a mutual friend of both myself and Zach, is that um, a gentleman by the name of Brian Gill. Now, you will recall that we had Brian on the show a year ago, 12, 18 months ago, it was a little while ago. Well, I am uh, participating in a webinar this Saturday morning, 10 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time, um, uh, with Brian. In fact, I'm getting together with him tonight to do a, a bit of a trial run. But we're doing a, he's doing a, a, a full, fully fledged professional webinar with the Australian Voice Association, of which I am currently the national president. And we're doing a, a webinar with him this weekend. Um, if you want more details about that, head over to the Voice Essentials Community Facebook page, and there are some links um, in that, in the general discussion flow. Um, and an advert and or whatever. If you're really, really super keen and serious about vocal pedagogy, and because this is going to really be deep, this is going to be like sort of top tier stuff. But if you are super keen, then I really encourage you to go over, enroll in the webinar. It's 75 uh, Australian dollars, which in the US speak, currently that's about 50 US bucks. And, uh, and so I'd encourage you to participate in that because it is going to be super, super interesting. Brian, and I'm sure Zach will tell us in a second how good Brian is. He is, he is one of the world's leading experts in, in voice. Anyway, I wanted to tell you about that because I don't want you to miss out if you are going to participate. Enough of that sort of housekeeping. Let's get over to introducing our special guest because, oh, hang on a second. Let me let me make sure that it's all this is the thing see as you all know i do this show by myself so i've got to press all the right buttons i am getting there i promise we'll we'll come back to zach right after this sound check check one check two hey hey zach hey 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 how you doing Doing well. Thanks for having me on the show. It's so good to have you on the show. Do you know what? I need to ask a question because this is important moving forward. 
I've listed your name here as Zach because that's kind of how I've always known you. But I've noticed that in a lot of your stuff, you, you, you do use the full Zachary. What do you prefer? Look, most people I know call me Zach, but uh, you know, when I'm in trouble, my parents would call me Zachary. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, you're so, not going to be in trouble here. I'm sure. No, no. Oh, At least oh, I hope oh, not. Oh, so oh, let's oh, let's stick to. I'll be Dan instead of Daniel, and you can be Zach instead of Zachary. And we'll, like that. and we'll we'll that'll be all good, mate. It is so good to have you on the show. We, you know, beginning of this year, I really made it um, my intention to to um, highlight some of the the just fabulous people we have here in Australia and invite invite them onto the show um, uh, as a part of my as a part of the live show and so we've had we've had a whole range of different people people that you know um, Ingrid James Emma Dean um, Francesca de Valiance. and yeah. in fact it was actually when I was thinking about having you on the show it's funny because i've actually also had craig burnett on the show from years ago and that's how we kind of really got to know each other wasn't it? when we did the Jesus jc superstar. superstar thing with craig and francesca and and you were stuck behind a guitar where you could have equally been doing the vocals um and uh that was a fun show wasn't it that was a lot of fun. We, we did that, and I think simultaneously at the, uh, the, the Australian Gospel Music Festival, it was oh, called Easter Fest at the time. We did, we did too. The Gospel Pro uh, Project with Jeremy yeah, O'Connor. We did. Oh, I found that show so hard to do. I was I was so out of my comfort zone doing that show. You nailed it. You did really oh, well. You you are t you actually are too kind, because I look back on some of those recordings and I know I didn't. <laughs> Were you on? You were playing guitar for that as well. Uh, no, for that I was in the. Uh, oh, the you were in the vocals. Yeah. You were in the choir. I was in the choir. Dude, yeah. you could have equally been out the front doing the doing the lead vocal with me. I was happy doing where I was. <laughs> um, and and this is the thing, and what I want people to know about you is that you you are this multi-talented human being. Like you, you play um, exceptional guitar. To the point where you were able to, you know, do the guitar for JC Superstar, which is no mean feat. Um, uh, but you, but your real passion, where, where you found yourself going, is is down the road of voice. What, what got you interested in voice, and what what sort of caused you to focus in on on singing teaching? Well, I think it was a. Firstly, just considering myself a singer took me some time. You know, I was always confident with the guitar and did singing from behind the guitar. There was a comfort there. There was a safety there, playing in duos, doing duets, doing backing. Um, but it took me a number of years to feel confident with my voice and um, with the help of teachers like Irene Bartlett, who we have, I think, as a mutual mentor and, and others. I started to feel more confident with my singing. And, uh, and I also started to really... Uh, become passionate about the idea of understanding the voice as an instrument mm. and the mechanics you know there was things that were quite mysterious and still are somewhat mysterious but there are, there are a lot of answers um, that people have discovered through research and exploration and uh, yeah and through using tools like semi occluded vocal tract postures and other exercises and knowledge um, things that were barriers to vocal freedom and expression um, gradually became easier to attain and, and I felt this in my own voice and uh, and through observation at the you know I was studying at the conservatorium I saw that in, in others lessons um, and there was something about that that I just loved you know being able to help people because everybody who gets into music you know generally has something to express something to say and it's frustrating when a physical tension or uh, challenge gets in the way of that freedom and expression and uh, when I found out there was science, you know, and research behind voice and that uh, this knowledge could be taken, was being taken by many voice teachers and applied to help people become more free and expressive, I thought, this is something I want to I wanna do. It almost appeared like magic, the wizardry. You know? <laughs> when I would see someone do a, you know, struggle on a high note and then they would do some crazy exercise, make a funny sound, do a trill, and all of a sudden the note would almost like, effortlessly come out of them I went man this is amazing 
yeah. and then the joy that people you know seeing people uh, have as a result of that is it's contagious you know i want i want to be around that so that was kind of the turning point and um and then i just continued to pursue voice teaching after taking some of those vocal pedagogy classes um just over 10 years ago now and uh, and then i pursued it pretty heavily and uh and haven't turned back yeah and in fact you pursued it so heavily that you found yourself moving to the u.s and you you spent considerable amount of time in New York. Tell us about your experiences in, in moving there and the people that you've had the opportunity to work with because the list is, is quite a prestigious one. Yes, well, I'll firstly say I've been blessed. I didn't expect many of the things that have happened in my life to happen, but I'm so thankful that they have and that I've met so many wonderful people. I'll start with, I guess, the mentors, you know, because it was through these mentors that I studied and took short courses and have continued to have um, ongoing relationships. But one of the reasons I moved to New York was uh, through an email with a, a well-known voice teacher on, on the internet who you've interviewed, Justin Stoney. And I remember watching his show back in probably 2012, I think, and it had like three episodes up or four episodes up. And, uh, and so I, I, I just finished my master's at the con and was trying to figure out what do I do next? Do I go and study speech pathology? I knew I wanted to, to learn more about how the voice works and I knew I wanted to help people in that, that realm. Anyway, I'd been on a couple of holidays to New York and I knew I loved New York because of the theater scene, the jazz scene, live music. And I figured, well, there's a lot of singers there. They probably need a lot of voice teachers. <laughs> <laughs> so long story short, I, I watched a couple of these episodes, loved what I saw. And, and I really loved the way in which Justin presented information and cared about people and, and the person. So I wrote to him and I just said, I really love what you've put out uh, so far. And uh, look, I've been to New York a couple of times. I would love to, to move over to the States. This is, you know, a little bit about me. What do you think? Do you think I could make it as a voice teacher? And I thought, you know, this guy's a busy guy. He probably won't be able to get back to my email. Anyway, the next day I get this mammoth... <laughs> novel of an email just full of encouragement and you know if you ever come over to the states please let's meet up you know what you're doing is sounding great you know you're on the right track type of thing so a year later i moved to new york and uh and shortly after that i started working for justin and i, I studied with him in his 40-hour course um and we continue to work together now um and then at, shortly after moving to new york i also started studying at nyu uh, with dr brian gill who you just mentioned, who's awesome, um, a top voice teacher and researcher, and studied with him at NYU and privately and have continued working with him. Um, and then I also reconnected with someone who I connected with in Australia in 2010. I was a, a subject in a study that Dr. John Melton did at the University of Queensland. And uh, Dr. Ryan Bartlett, she suggested I, I, I take part in this study measuring uh, you know, the way that singers and actors breathe across different genres, etc. So I went in as a young jazz singer and, and took part in that and talked with John. And then when I moved to New York, that was 2010, when I moved to New York in 2013, John was one of the first people I called for a lesson. And, uh, and after the lesson, she took the time to talk and, and really welcomed me to the city. Um, and I took her course there over that next year and uh, continued to be in contact and work with Joan and, and are now doing multiple research projects with Joan. So three people who uh, really made me feel at home in New York, uh, I would call mentors and then really took me under their wing and, and have continued to, to be teachers that have influenced my path as a voice teacher. So I'm very thankful for that. Yeah, that level of, of pedigree is just extraordinary i mean it has to you know you you are as you you've said to me many times you feel very blessed and and you are i mean there's just the opportunity to spend time with you know just justin's a great guy but it, you know when i think of the brian gills and the joan meltons of the world wow to, to just have opportunity to spend time with one of them is is amazing but the fact that you've had time to intimately you know, work with with both of those individuals and Justin is just extraordinary. I think it's 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 such a such a special thing. And now, of course, you you're continuing to do research with Joan. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes. Well, a year ago, I was in New York. It was the first time I'd visited since moving back to Brisbane. In uh, I moved back here in 2017. 
but I went over to New York for about a month and uh, to do a couple of things, do some teaching and presenting and so on. But I did, we did some data collection for this study. Uh, Joan is a wonderful voice coach who does so many things, but one of the things that she does and has been doing for about the last 14 or 15 years is coach um, for the plays outside uh, Shakespeare in the Park put on by New York Classical Theatre Company. And right. so we wanted to do a study where we looked at the acoustic characteristics of vocal sounds used by these actors in outdoor environments. Oh, okay. But in the summer, you know, over two or three months, they'll put on something like Hamlet or A Midsummer's Night Dream, and you'll have three, four, five, six hundred people out in the park. And what happens is, is that they perform a scene in one location, and then, you know, 20 minutes in, one of the actors will say, go yonder, and then you walk over a hill, and then there's actors ready on the top of this hill, and they'll perform the next scene. And so you're competing with airplanes going overhead, taxis, sirens, tourists walking through Central Park. And so we wanted to figure out how do these actors perform for two hours um, outdoors with all of this competition? What do they do? And, uh, and so we've, uh, yeah, we've, we're in the process of editing at the moment, hopefully to be published in the Journal of Voice. And, and Joan presented that at the, uh, the Voice Symposium online. Just can you, can you give us any insights into the findings? Yeah, so some of the, the things that may be uh, common knowledge to professional actors, or at least in that realm, but I think are really good to, to note, are that we found that these classical actors, uh, both genders, I think it was four males, four females, um, use up to, upwards of about three octaves, or up to about three octaves at least. Uh, and if we compare that with untrained male and female speakers in everyday life, they generally tend to speak around an octave or just under that. Mm. Um, obviously, there's exceptions. So wide pitch range is key. Um, we found that the, the average sound pressure level, you know, in terms of decibels in the park, was about 80 decibels, and that uh, both males and females talked above that, which sounds kind of obvious, like talk louder than the background noise. But in terms of how they do that, wow. they use their voice, their, you know, acoustically, uh, they shape the vocal tracts or, or the, their throat and their mouth in certain ways so that their voice is uh, easily heard over all of these background noises. And that, that's, that was another key finding. And we've got to do further studies to figure out exactly how that's done. But um, yeah, something called, known as the actor's formant cluster is, is yeah. being used by both male and, and female actors. And, and did you, did you, were you able to observe whether this, these actors were doing it intuitively or had they been trained to do that? Well, my understanding is that all of the actors we had were quite experienced. I think the youngest of them was late 20s, early 30s, and, and I think they'd all done undergraduate work in, in training in, in acting and voice. Um, but I think part of it has to be intuitive. And again, this, this is something that probably needs to be studied further. But if the background noise is ever changing, you know, you've yeah. got an airplane overhead yeah. and then it gets quieter and then all of a sudden a group of people walk by with a boombox, you know, actors are probably consciously or, you know, subconsciously having to adjust um, their output of sound to meet the demands. But there yeah. was, the average level they were putting out was, all, you know, on, it was on average higher than the wow. uh, average of the ambient noise, which is really interesting. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, there, there is just so many... <laughs> the, uh, and I say this on the show, you know, a lot, and that is that... that there is so much about this voice thing that we don't know, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and and um, I'm often encouraging people to be very wary of, you know, um, online spaces, and it's typically in the online realm where, you know, you've you've got these expressions of knowledge that sort of says we've got it all figured out. This is how you do it, you know. You know, I can see you, your mouth was like, oh, you know, because we don't, do we? There's just, oh. there is so much that we don't know. And, and, I, and I dare say there's so much that we currently think we know that is actually incorrect. That's true. And I think that's where we have to be really careful, you know, about particularly when you hear people who are dogmatic about this is the way, this is the... Yeah, you know, I, I remember Dr. Johann Sundberg uh, at a, a conference that I went to in New York a few years back. He said, "Look for the people who are searching for the answers, not for the people who have claimed to find all the answers." Yeah, 
you know, or that's paraphrased, but and I remember thinking that's that's a really wise thing coming from one of the world's leading, leading. pedagogues. Yes, yes. Um, so yeah. all the more reason I should not be dogmatic about. <laughs> and it is it is all too easy when we're in the world of teaching, isn't it, to be to find ourselves, you know, becoming dogmatic because we as human beings we do fall into habitual behaviours, um, and and habits cause us to be comfortable and sure. and and comfortability for can you know then cause us to be protective of that comfort and i think that's where dogma can can sneak in um but yeah i think you know if you're able to stay around inquisitive minds like the justin stoney's and the brian gills and the joan milton's and the zach bradford's then um <laughs> we can we can you know hold on to our knowledge with an open hand as opposed to with knuckles clenched white i think that's that's one of the keys um you mentioned before um about semi-occluded vocal tract postures and can i just highlight so you when i invite guests on i often say look you know send me your top three things that you'd like that you're really passionate about at the moment this is one of your one of yours you now, it turns out that one of my favorite topics is semi-occluded vocal tract exercises. And I also love the way, because I use the word um, posture, not just for body alignment, but also for laryngeal postures. I, mm. I use that term a lot. And I love the fact that you used that as well. You, I mean, feel free to talk about why you use that word, but more to the point, I wonder if you could, if I can just turn this off, that's obviously someone trying to, get in contact with me. You're um, popular, it's good. I'm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for all the wrong reasons. Um, I wonder if you can talk to us about vocal postures, you know, um, uh, sorry, vo uh, semi-occluded vocal tract postures, and talk to us about what you've found uh, uh, beneficial. Maybe give, just to outline what they are for people who are maybe watching the show for the first time. Um, some of my old some of the regulars will know what they are, but just highlight what they are and where you find the benefits for them in your teaching. Sure. Well, essentially, a semi-occluded vocal tract posture is when part of the vocal tract, and the vocal tract starts at your larynx or at your, your voice box and runs all the way to your lips and your nostrils. So when some part of this tube, this bent tube, is partially blocked off, then what happens is a resistance builds up or a pressure can build up somewhere downstream or somewhere further away from your vocal folds. So let's give the example with a lip trill. If you do a lip trill, <laughs> pressure builds up behind your lips and teeth and, uh, and the resistance created by your lips and the pressure built up there helps to take away or can help to take away pressure beneath your vocal folds. And that can then assist them in their vibration, make it easier for them to vibrate. So essentially you're taking advantage of certain blockages or certain shaping of the, the vocal tract to help the vocal folds to vibrate more easily, uh, which is great because we have the ability to see some, some, of, uh, some of the vocal tract, particularly in terms of the tongue, the lips, the amount of jaw opening, those things we have good conscious control over and are able to see in, uh, in the mirror and uh, yeah, have, usually have a, a pretty good awareness of that and can learn to heighten that awareness. Um, so in terms of what that does on a deeper level is that helps to do two things that Dr. Ingo Tite often talks about, which is to stretch and unpress. So the unpressing has to do with moving the vocal folds apart or adducting them so that when they vibrate, we minimize collision. Mm. And in doing so, in minimizing that collision force, we can reduce friction. Um, as my mentor, Dr. Brian Gill, often says, it's famous for saying, friction is the enemy of the vocal fold tissue. So anything we can do to, to diminish that, uh, that friction, regardless of style or mode of uh, voice use, mode of phonation, it's gonna be good for sustainability, minimizing effort level, um, and just freeing, freeing the voice so that uh, people are free to be more expressive. So that's the unpressing part. And then that unpressing can actually help facilitate the stretching of the vocal fold tissue, which is great for a couple of reasons. One, uh, stretching the vocal folds is a key component of uh, pitch changing and accessing a wide range of pitches. But uh, stretching the muscle also allows blood flow to the tissue, which is healthy for muscle tissue. So 
lots of great things um, that you can get just by doing a lip trill or a raspberry or any number of semi-occluded vocal tract postures. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, in recent years, we've had the addition of straw phonation, yeah. which is a another form of semi-occlusion, um, but it actually double almost for in often cases doubles the length of the vocal tract because it's often it's the length of that tract that has an impact on the acoustic values as well, doesn't it? Correct. Yeah. So lengthening the vocal tract by using the straw. <laughs> Or even if you don't ha have a straw, or you're trying to be environmentally friendly without the plastic straws, <laughs> you can't get your hands on a metal straw. You can do things like rounding the lips yeah. and exploring various, uh, you know, modifications of vowels and exercises. Puffy cheeks. Uh, to, to yeah. yeah, the puffy mm. cheek exercise yeah. or whistle type exercises, yeah. etc., can give you a, a similar but different result. Then you've got the variations with the straw and the water, which a lot of people do, the bubble phonation. Yes. You get the added resistance of the water, and yes. it's fun to splash around. Kids love that one. I, I actually tend to, I must admit, I tend to use the straw in the water, water container more often than I do just the straw, simply because it's less gross. <laughs> <laughs> Is that okay for me to admit? Yeah. I, I, yeah. I just, I hate Especially this, during COVID, yeah. I hate this. Well, exactly. Yes. See, I'm ahead of my time, right? <laughs> the spit's got to go somewhere, but that might as well go in the bottle and not in the Oh, room. there's just, there, because it does form a bit of spittle, doesn't it, at the end of the, you know, I, I, I used to just give students not only the straw, but a tissue, and I'd say, look, just continue to dab the end of the yeah. <laughs> And I just got into the habit, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm just going to give you a water bottle and we're going to do it into a water bottle and then we're none the wiser. Exactly. Another good one is you get them to, you know, in winter especially, you get them to take their jacket or a, a scarf or something and fold it over and, and you know. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah, you get the benefit of articulation as well so they can practice the text or, or lyrics of a song. And again, the spit's not, hopefully not going all around the room the same way it would if they were doing something else. So. Yeah, I mean, it, you, you raised some interesting points regarding... Um, COVID and we're probably not, that would be a, a tributary that we probably shouldn't go down. But yeah, there's a whole range of things that people do need to be aware of, don't they, in regards to COVID. Not only the, um, the development of droplet, but the conveyance of COVID via aerosol. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a thing for, for us singing teachers because you're, you're teaching all of your stuff online now, currently. Primarily, I started going back uh, minimally in person, but still, I would say three quarters of my studio is, is online. It's still online, yeah. yeah. Um, so you you've you have come back to Australia. Let's 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 sort of do the full circle. You were in New York. You've come back to Australia. You, you decided to to gift Brisbane again with with you, um, and uh, you've got a really successful studio happening um, on the northern side of of Brisbane. Um, Tell us a bit more about that. Sure, yes. Yeah. So I moved back in 2017 after being in New York for over four years, four and a half years, and, uh, and started this studio in conjunction with New York Vocal Coaching, who I was working with uh, from about 2014 all the way through to 2017 in person. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that way, you know, I've been able to continue a relationship with them and partner with them on certain projects. Uh, as well as continue to work with students of mine in New York and other parts of the US who I was working with at the time. And yeah, some of those students now, it's been, gosh, almost seven years, six years of working with them, you know, in person online. And when I went back last year, I saw many of those students again in person, which was great to reconnect yeah. uh, with, with them. But uh, yeah, you know, I, working with other projects, um, Justin and, and a few others who have been invited and I are working on a project that will launch later this year. We can't announce the exact website yet because it's still under construction. But the premise of this is it's a project in vocal pedagogy. And we're going to interview and uh, produce content, feature articles, etc., cetera, um, honoring heroes of voice pedagogy, both uh, are living right now and uh, of the past. And uh, our first guest is Dr. Johan Sundberg. We're excited to have him as our first honoree. Uh, so that, that'll be launching later this year and information will be up on the New York Vocal Coaching platforms probably in the next few months. 
uh, and we'll release the name of the website, etc. Yeah, that's wow, fun. that's awesome. Um, well, that that's that'll be a project to look out for, which is which is exciting, and you know, um, and this is I just want to point out for people who are watching who who may be not sort of initiated into the world of, of voice and teaching singing or learning singing. I just want to highlight for everyone, you know, and, and, and Zach has not been doing this to name drop, but this is, this is a really key point about who we orientate ourselves and our, our connections with where we feed information from is that the names that Zach has been mentioning just offhand uh, are the leading experts in voice pedagogy and research in the world, not just because Zach has had the opportunity to meet them, but because these are the cutting edge people, the Johann Sundbergs, the Inga Titzes, the Brian Gills, you know, these, these people are really um, the, the, the leading experts. And, and it's important that we, you know, here at Voice Essentials continue to to go in search of these this level of instruction that we don't just read some blog on um, on online so some blogs are brilliant um, Jess Baldwin's um, blog about popular music vocals is is wonderful um, but but equally there's there's a whole heap of not so high level um, blogs out there and we do have to be really careful don't we Zach about who we orientate to how do you find yourself i mean because you've obviously done just been so clever in the way you've known where to find your information how do you go about identifying the right information if you will to to yeah. orientate to that's a good question you know i'll say one thing and that is the more questions i ask you know i get certain answers and then the more questions i have i tend to, to find myself with more questions all over my plate than answers so I feel like that's an eternal thing, you know, being a lifelong student. But advice that was given to me by Brian Gill, it was that, uh, you know, find the, the top two or three or four experts in a certain area. So if it's breathing or acoustics or whatever the area might be, um, mindfulness, et cetera, and have a look at their work and, and look at what the, where the overlap is. Where do, where do the leading experts in a field agree? Mm. And chances are if Dr. Ingo Tietze and Dr. Johann Sundberg and Ron Shearer and, you know, Catherine Vertolini and, and you know, they, if they all agree on, on this, there's a good chance that there's something to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, um, and then the things that they disagree on, keep asking questions, keep exploring, keep experimenting. So I think uh, the more, yeah, the more I learn, the more questions I have, the less I, I become kind of like set in stone on certain things. Yeah. And I'm um, just looking for where there's agreement in the research, but also in uh, in things that have been tried and, and tested in terms of practical application that haven't yet been explored in research so an area that i know um uh, there is growing agreeance on <laughs> is is um the the area of resonance and voice acoustics um, as we learn more about you know the way the the, the behavior of the vocal tract in the way it it you know suppresses some resonances and and highlights others it's an area that i know that you're you've got particular interest in teach us a little bit about this area in the area of how how the voice you know um produces different resonance frequencies and acoustics sure sure in, well in, uh, you know, something in 10 minutes okay <laughs> Let's roll up the sleeves. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, let's start with what we all have in common, what we all have in common across genres, etc. That is that everybody um, generally has two lungs and they have two vocal folds. There are exceptions. And air from the lungs sets the vocal folds into vibration under certain conditions when they're positioned in a certain way. That vibration interrupts what's known as the transglottal airflow, the air that moves between the vocal folds to what's known as the glottis, that space between the vocal folds. And then that vibration, what it does is it creates changes in, in pressure. And, uh, and that's where we get our sound wave. So air from the lungs sets the vocal folds into vibration. We get a sound wave. And in that sound wave is certain information. 
that information then travels through the vocal tract. And, uh, and so within that information, we have what are known as harmonics. I won't go into partials and overtones, and that's for another time. But essentially, there's these different parts of the signal. And depending on how we shape our vocal tract, we're going to boost or highlight some of those harmonics, and then we're going to suppress some of the other harmonics. And that's going to influence things like volume, timbre, intonation, etc. Um, so what we can do and what really skilled vocalists do is they learn how to shape their vocal tract in such a way that they boost the information they want to to create a certain type of sound um, and suppress other parts of the information. So that's, that's one component. And, uh, and what I've kind of just talked about there is resonance in what's often referred to, and this is super geeky, but what's often referred to in terms of a linear direction. So for a long time, people have kind of thought, well, ear sets the vocal folds into vibration. This vibration travels through the vocal tract and the listener receives it. But for, you know, since I think the 80s, I know Dr. Tietze and, and some others have been doing studies since then and exploring the idea of this back and forth relationship. Yeah. You know, and that, that's, that's what I get really excited about. So not only does the way in which we shape our mouth and our throat and so on, does that impact the quality of the sound, the timbre, the tone, but what it can also do if we learn to shape it as, as singers and speakers um, with precision is that we can then send a backwards flow of energy to our vocal folds that can assist with their vibration. Yeah. And, uh, and that's a really cool thing because that's then going to impact the evenness and, like I said before, minimizing friction, which um, relates to sustainability and so on, effort level. But it also means that uh, you can use different mouth shapes to elicit, elicit different responses here. So it might be, mean using a certain mouth shape to encourage a certain register, like getting into head voice, for instance. Um, and as a teacher, that's a really valuable thing too. So if someone's, say, not used to singing in, in head voice and, uh, and you're wanting to help them experience, experience that, using certain vocal track shapes to, uh, to help facilitate that is a super cool way to get someone experiencing a new register or yeah maybe moving more smoothly through a register than they have because there is this back and forth relationship. Yeah. And uh, kind of like uh, the analogy that I, I really like is the difference between uh, the actor in a sound studio, you know, recording like a film versus the actor on stage with the audience. Mm. You know, the linear model is more mm. like the actor in the sound studio. And no matter what they do, the audience will eventually get the performance via the recording on the camera. But the audience's response isn't going to have any influence on the way the actor continues their performance. Yeah. Whereas singing more often than not is more like the the performer on the stage with the audience. You know, the the performer is the source of energy, and the audience is kind of like the vocal track. They're the filter, and what they what they do, whether they clap or cheer, boo or laugh, is likely to have some impact on how the performer's ongoing performance uh, continues. Does the the performer get flustered and start to forget lines, or do they get you know, more adrenaline and start to, you know. Give yeah, a I love that form. analogy. I've, I've not heard that one before. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's modified from Dr. Brad's story. He had a wonderful article on resonance uh, from, from 2000. And uh, I think you might be able to find it on the uh, uh, National uh, Center for Voice and Speech. Yeah, okay. Very good. I, I think we'll, what will be in interesting to see um, as we continue to learn more about that nonlinear process and I've heard I'm, I, I, I don't know whether I think it was Inga Titzer here in Brisbane in 2013 but I could be wrong if it was either him or Johan Sundberg I heard in Stockholm in 2017 one of them talked about um, little um, eddies so if we if we think about a river flowing down and then off to the side in these little little moments along the of the edge you get these little side eddies you know where where you get little swirls of of captured um uh energy and and water flow and they often have we call them here in australia i think we call them eddies don't we these little whirlpools mm, on the side yeah. and it will be and, and and there's growing sort of awareness that we even have those little side eddies happening as the vocal as the as the energy flows through um and then back and you know so there's yeah it's it's a big big world of discovery 
fascinating. It's fascinating, and particularly when it can be, you know, applied. It's it's complex and it's it's different with every individual. But when you can explore that with the, an individual and, and they can start again expressing themselves more freely, it's just a change of mouth shape. Sometimes it can be it's such a tiny change, or, you know, perceptually can make such a big difference in effort level or ease in terms of accessing a note. You know, it's wild. Now, as I'm as we're talking about this, I've just realised I don't think we've talked about the actual topic of the difference in <laughs> <laughs> so we should do that um in the, in the five fun, yeah. in the five or so minutes that we've got left let's let's talk about your 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 thoughts around the difference you know of what different genres require in how we approach them differently technically sure well another analogy that i, I really like that kind of highlights the similarities and differences was one that was given to me by Irene Bartlett and Adele Nisbet um, back when I studied at the con and that was the idea of a tree. So the trunk of the tree represents the similarities that uh, that we could use with all voice use like I mentioned before, vocal folds vibrating as a result of airflow from the lungs and then that sound wave that's produced travels through the vocal tract etc. And then there's other things in terms of I use the word tuning strategies or resonance strategies so the way in which we shape the, the vocal tract or the mouth to resonate the sound. Yeah. So for instance, there's some really common strategies that are used in classical uh, music, for instance, like a, what's commonly referred to as a head voice strategy. The technical name is um, F1 to H1. Um, that's often used by classical singers, female singers up uh, above their second passaggio into the really high extremities of the voice and so on. So while that's a really common strategy for, for females in classical music to use, I wouldn't say that that goes on the classical branch exclusively, but it's actually something that many pop singers, if you look at Whitney Houston singing Saving All My Love For You, she uses that strategy selectively, not throughout the whole song for sure, but on the word you, you know, towards the end she sings for you over and over. <laughs> and you watch her and her lips get become more narrow and there's a loftier sound and, and a more head voice register is, mm. is accessed. Um, and you can use certain technology to kind of um, make an educated guess that that's the, the strategy she's using, which is, again, what most classical singers would do in that same range. Um, but then what's different is that someone like a Whitney Houston or a Celine Dion will also use other strategies that, say, most opera singers won't use, where the mouth is more lateralized or more open. I think the danger comes in when we think that belts is only open and classical singers up in that range only close. That's a that's dangerous territory. There's a lot more crossover and shared branches or vines or however you want to explore that analogy. And I think um, the best singers in any style have the flexibility to to use those shapes to their advantage, the ones that are stylistically appropriate, as well as the ones that make it easy for them to access um, an easier coordination. But what sets the expert level singers, the Stevie Wonders and the Brian McKnight's and the Cynthia Erivo's and Aretha Franklin's is that they also do things that most of us find very difficult. They do shapes where the mouth goes wide open, which for most people, beginners particularly, when they do shapes like that on, on notes in and above their transition, there's a tendency to push or use what's often referred to as pressed phonation. Um, and these top level singers figure out how to do those shapes and tune really well in what's often referred to as a yell belt, um, but without yelling, without pressing, without having too much force in the throat and, uh, and a good amount of airflow and so on. Mm. So I think in terms of the, the differences, um, yeah, there's, again, I'm, I'm, I should mention too, I don't teach classical voice and so on, but I teach a wide range in the contemporary world. Um, flexibility with all of these different things, the different ways of shaping things, but also the different types of phonation. There's, there's flexibility um, in terms of a breathier type of phonation or a stronger type of phonation. That being said, some styles may use a smaller range and not use the open mouth shapes as much and might rely more on breathy phonation for a good portion of a song. Whereas a, a big power belty ballad, you know, might require a bit more connection more of the time, like particularly in like soul or something like that. Yeah. I think it's even been studied. Um, but that doesn't mean either that the person singing the soul belty ballad is going to be belting the whole time. There's going to be parts within that song where they're going to belt. They're going to have maybe a little more connection at the vocal fold level, 
more open mouth uh, on, on climactic parts of the song. But if you look at the, the, the really good, the top singers in any of those styles, there's flexibility of the system. They're able to move between registers easily. They're able to move between mouth shapes easily, phonation types from breathy to, to a stronger connection um, with ease. And I think that's what we have to look, look for with our singers, with our students, is, is finding that flexibility to move between all of those different um, variabilities. Yeah, it's about, isn't it? It's about identifying what are the, the um, key strategies. It's almost, it's almost like you have to learn the rules and then learn how to break the rules. Well said. You, you know, and we, we have to, I think for beginner singers, it's really important that we lay a foundation where the voice is caused to, to draw within the lines you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and colour within the lines. And to start with, you might only use primary colours while you're doing that. But of course, that's not when, what Rembrandt or Michelangelo did. You know, they, they, they st stepped outside the lines and they, they used a, a wide array of colours on their palette and often did it in a very unorthodox way. And when we think of uh, Aretha Franklin, you know, it, you, you could quite easily say that there's a lot, so many things and strategies that she's employing that are wonderfully unorthodox. Mm. When we think about the, the beginner level strategies that we learn as singers. Um, but she was Aretha Franklin and, and she had, as you said, discovered how she was able to use her own unique, amazing instrument mm. to do those things and to do them in a healthy, and sustainable way. That's the key word, right? And that's what we have to figure out. And, and everybody's different. I think that's the hard thing is that people yeah. hear someone like Aretha yeah. and maybe their voice <laughs> isn't built that same way. You know, and that's a hard thing. It doesn't mean yes. they, they can't belt. No, they can learn to belt, but everybody, you know, you look at the best belters, for instance, and Kristen Chenoweth, when she belts, has a very different, very different. type of belt to Jennifer Hudson, yeah. you know? But they're both, Amazing. Wonderful. But they're different voices, different yes. instruments. And that, we, you know, it's amazing how many conversations I have with my guests on the show. Um, and, and I'm not surprised that our discussion today has sort of landed us back at a place where we often land at, and that is your, your instrument is unique. And, and it's so important that you celebrate and explore that wonderful uniqueness amen and that you become comfortable with that you know um because you you, you don't you, it ain't going to change that's <laughs> it's always it's always going to have that uniqueness so you might as well embrace it that's it zach i've enjoyed having you on the show mate which i knew knew i i would and um and i'm kind of you know Thank you, COVID, for, for causing Zach to still be in Brisbane, because you you would have been you would have been in the US right now, I think, wouldn't you? Yeah, I would have probably been over in the US right now, just getting back. Yeah. Yeah. So, good to have you on the show, mate. I really appreciate um, the, the the time. We, <laughs> I think, I think the last time you and I saw each other was uh, 2018 in the Blue Mountains. Oh yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it was a good, it was a great conference was with Brian. Brian was um, the keynote, keynote Brian yeah. Gill. And, um, and I think at that, at, at that thing, you know, I made a commitment. I remember saying to you, no, we're definitely, we're going to catch up. We, you know, <laughs> you know, and then, and then life we'll get away from us yeah. and then life happens. So I'm, I'm glad we were able to catch up. <laughs> me too. Thanks so much for having me on the show. It's it was so, so good to have you on the show and, um, and uh, really, I, you know, I really enjoyed having you. So thank you for coming on. You stay right there. I'm just going to wrap up and, um, and then we'll, we'll have a, a quick moment. Well, there you go, everyone. Zach Bradford, or if he's in trouble, Zachary Bradford. Um, so good to have him on the show. Look, if you've, if you've enjoyed today's show, I, I encourage you, there's a link in the description section below. You can go and learn more about Zach um, uh, via that link um, on his uh, on his. Uh, I went to say channel, but on his website. Um, and uh, there are such amazingly talented people like Zach working 
you know, to, for us to discover more about this whole world of singing and and uh, and I know that you, um, I know you'll have enjoyed, you know, just this, you know, someone knows what they're talking about when they're able to explain things, quite complex things in really accessible language. That's, that's the key. And Zach did that all throughout today's show. Um, and so I know that you'll have enjoyed um, our discussion. Uh, so make sure you give it a thumbs up, share it with friends, singers far and wide um, so they can take advantage of today's show. Um, next week, we're going to be coming back with a Q&A, a question and answer. If you've had questions from today's show, um, they'll be, Linda will have grabbed them and put them into uh, the Word document ready for next week. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the white bell icon because that's the way that YouTube will let you know every Monday, Australian Eastern Standard Time at 1 p.m. that we're going live. So I hope to see you next week. I hope you stay safe, um, especially at this time. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you. Have a great week, everyone. I'm Dr. Dan. Sing well.